Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Yeah, thank you, thank you everybody for, for coming and thanks uh, to the conveners of the seminar series and, and to the Royal College for inviting me and for hosting me uh, in Edinburgh tonight. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present this material here today. It's something I'm working on at the moment um, as a contribution to an, an edited volume on uh, paper and gender, where a couple of a group of historians of science and medicine want to really think about paper as a material. Paper is something that is still, even in the days of the so called paperless office, something that is really ubiquitous in our everyday practices of doing science or doing medicine, uh, but something that is usually fairly invisible in the way in the way we, we work. Um, so the purpose of the of the group was very much to think about the kinds of uh, material consequences that working with paper has and also the ways in which um, it contributes to um, articulating or challenging um, certain gender roles and, and gendered practices. Um, so today what I want to talk about is um, anatomical models made from a kind of paper, paper or papier uh, mache, but I'm going to put that in into the context of other types of uh, of models and and materials. So uh, let me start with uh, some of these uh, models, just to give you an example, um, because. Um, what these kinds of ivory models, these ivory miniatures uh, here from the Welcome Collection show is that sexuality and reproduction have long been central features of anatomical representations. Early modern, modern models such as, such as these in, in ivory often presented binary pairs of uh, male and female uh, bodies side by side. Usually the female body, as in this case, was pregnant, so you could open up the belly and, and see the little fetus inside. Um, now, um, scholars who have looked at these models more closely have argued that they often played a key role in articulating and often affirming culturally and historically specific uh, male and female roles, despite a supposed allegiance to an objective and timeless truth. Uh, Ludmila Jordanova's classic study, Sexual Visions, for instance, um, looked at the aesthetic features of the celebrated anatomical wax models of 18th century Italy that some of you may be familiar with from places such as Bologna and Florence. Um, and what she argues is that despite their medical accuracy and anatomical detail, the models were simultaneously uh, deeply indebted to contemporary assumptions about the roles of men and women in society. Uh, so just to give you two examples of a male and female model uh, from those Italian uh, workshops here. So female models uh, were frequently posed as so-called anatomical venuses. They were recumbent and passive, with beautiful intact faces and skin adorned by long hair and decorative uh, details. In many cases, at, such as this, uh, the female models were pregnant and spectators could discover the small fetus. Um, inside the torso. So female uh, bodies were equated with passivity, with reproduction, with beauty and sexual allure. Male bodies, in contrast, were often depicted in upright and more active poses. Signifiers of beauty such as skin, face and hair were absent. Um, instead, the focus of male models tended to be on musculature or the nervous system. So wax modelers um, represented anatomical facts, but simultaneously they, these representations were also shaped by shared perceptions of gender roles and by artistic genres and conventions. Now, in the paper that I'm working on at the moment, I want to argue that it's crucial to understand such models not just as representations, but as technologies. Um, in the words of uh, historian of technology Francesca Bray, uh, for instance, as material objects which produce people and relationships between them. And I'd argue that the materiality of models shapes human interactions with them and perceptions of them in crucial ways. For instance, by enabling different types of practices of production and use, uh, widening access by increasing durability or by decreasing price levels. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. So a focus on the materiality of models, I would argue, reveals how the gendered identities of model makers and model users are implicated in practices of making, in practices of di distribution, 
um, and of use. And today, um, I want to use specifically the cases of some prominent 19th century models um, to ask how practices of model making and model use have supported, challenged, or in some cases obscured gendered perceptions of model makers and users. Um, and to ask what role the materiality of these artificial anatomies played in gendering the people who interacted with them. But first, let's, let's stay a little longer uh, with the 18th century waxes. Um, the famous anatomical wax models of 18th century Italy already gave rise to fairly complex configurations of gender and materiality, both in their production and their use. Here, gendered associations of the material wax could be used both to strengthen modelers' claims to authority and to call them into question. Um, in the case of the female um, anatomical wax modeler Anna Morandi, for instance, whom you can see here in a, uh, in a self-portrait uh, that is still on display in Bologna, in, her, in Morandi's case, um, her supporters claimed that uh, Morandi's femininity, um, and especially her status as a mother, um, actually gave her a superior understanding of the formation of the human body. Her contemporaries argued that motherhood gave her a feeling for the formation of flesh, uh, which at the time was frequently likened to wax. Um, however, um, to give you another example, the key modeling material wax and its gendered connotations uh, could be used not just to support uh, a female modeler's claim to mastery and verisimilitude, but it could also be used um, negatively to cast doubt on the abilities um, of model makers and users. In Vienna, for instance, um, the same Italian wax uh, models, when imported uh, to the local medical surgical academy, were criticized uh, very strongly by medical professionals and by satirists alike. Uh, the Viennese critics highlighted the model's similarity to frivolous playthings, uh, such as dolls, which were frequently made in wax at the time. Um, in the Viennese case, the models were lambasted as expensive but ultimately useless. In the words of contemporary critics, they were nothing but a toy for children and for persons who have no notion of science whatsoever, who regard such things as the child sees the doll. Um, the gendering language here became, became quite pronounced. Students and teachers who used models were ridiculed as immature and unmanly, in the words of contemporaries, as beardless boys and hermaphrodites. A key feature of this criticism, arguably, was the materiality of the models. Wax models, the critics argued, were fragile and thus not suitable for hands-on interaction, which many medical practitioners and educators considered to be central to medical education. Now, arguably, this gendering critique of the Viennese models was so ag aggressive precisely because models were widely praised as groundbreaking innovations, which might even render traditional dissection-based anatomy instruction obsolete, um, at least um, according to the claims of some of its proponents. Um, it might even make knowledge of the inside of the body more accessible to lay people. So despite uh, the Viennese critics, the models' claims to utility were widely accepted in the late 18th century. The international fame of wax model collections, especially those of Bologna and Florence, inspired reformers across Europe um, to exploit models' educational potential more fully. And a particularly strong commitment to the use of models for medical education uh, came from the French government under Napoleon. Um, he saw, the French, uh, he saw the Florentine wax models uh, during the French occupation of Tuscany in the late 18th century. And in 1806, uh, Napoleon then ordered the creation of a French anatomical modeling school in Rouen. Now, the school wasn't particularly long-lived. It was only active for about eight years. But its products made their way into prestigious anatomical collections, uh, such as, for instance, the Museum of the Faculty of Medicine in Paris. And there, they continued to elicit praise and to inspire future generations of anatomical modelers to think about ways of perfecting them as tools for medical education. And uh, it's those, it's in particular two model makers who were inspired by uh, those Parisian models that I want to talk about for the remainder um, of the presentation. Now, 
Experiments uh, with different materials were central to modelers' attempts at improvement in the service of public utility. Um, and the move to new materials then accordingly changed models' gendered associations and practices. Critics of the celebrated anatomical waxes, um, as I mentioned, had pointed out that such models were fragile and expensive. Wax was a very costly material, um, and individually sculpted models uh, required high levels of skill and time-consuming labor. Now, in order to address both of these issues of cost and skill, modelers resorted to a wide range of materials, of which you can see two examples here. In Florence, for instance, um, the director of the wax modeling workshop, Felice Fontana, had become disappointed uh, with his wax model's lack of robustness, and he um, then tried to produce decomposable models in wood instead. You can see the prototype here on the right. This is a model made from wood, which you were meant to be able to take apart and put back together again, but in practice it turned out that wood was actually too susceptible to distortions due to changes in humidity and temperature, um, so, so the model didn't stay decomposable for a very long um, time, and ultimately his experiment didn't get anywhere. Um, on the other hand, you also have in the 18th century and the early 19th century um, practitioners such as midwives and obstetricians who frequently used combinations of more robust materials such as textiles, wood and leather to produce um, so-called obstetric phantoms of birthing machines of which you can see an example here on the left of a, a model developed by the French royal midwife uh, Madame du Coudre as a way um, to uh, give practitioners ways of um, practicing hands-on uh, gestures of obstetric, of, obstet of obstetric work. Now today I want to focus specifically on one development uh, which um, arguably profoundly shaped model production and model use in the 19th century, and that's the move to papier-mâché. Um, a Norman physician, Jean-François Ameline, uh, succeeded in producing a small series of life-sized models, um, initially by modeling papier-mâché directly onto real bones and real skeletons. Ameline's progress in this is typical of the development of anatomical models through tinkering in ways which responded directly to present requirements of medical teachers um, and which highlight uh, the tension between models which imitate the haptic qualities of the body and those which imitate their visual appearance. As you can see, for instance, when you compare those obstetric phantoms with the wax models, the wax models look very realistic, but they don't feel anything like an actual body, whereas uh, presumably with the obstetric models, um, the, the primary purpose was not so much to make them look real, but to make them feel right. Now, Ameline um, began modeling as a student in the 1780s uh, by attaching ribbons and pieces of fabric to real bones in his attempt to understand the placement and connections uh, of muscles. He then took up modeling again when he, in turn, was appointed a teacher of anatomy in Caen in 1808. Um, and in his account, his first efforts were small sacks of leather filled and shaped like muscles. Plated threads served to represent arteries and nerves, and screws held everything in place. Now, Ameline did not consider these pieces perfect, despite many years of labor, but reported that they helped students remember details. Um, the prototype's advantages and disadvantages were closely tied to the choice of materials and their qualities. While, in his words, they presented to the touch a kind of su suppleness which related to that of the imitated organs, this very flexibility of the material simultaneously prevented Ameline from replicating uh, what he called certain protrusions and contours without which one cannot have a proper understanding of nature. Uh, and thus he be began to work with different materials and finally arrived at a model whose muscles were modeled in a solid cardboard on real bones. In this period, varieties of papier-mâché were used for a wide range of applications, ranging from doll-making and small domestic items such as trays and inkstands to larger pieces of furniture and architectural ornamentation. Um, so these types of um, objects don't seem to have carried particular gendered connotations, or at least not to the same degree as wax. 
At least Ameline kept quiet about potential re resemblances to toys, perhaps in order not to jeopardize models' acceptability to medical students and teachers. Other paper technologies were Ameline's most important point of reference when he put forward his arguments for the utility of his hybrid papier-mâché and bone models. He explicitly compared his teaching tools to popular anatomy manuals, uh, which were cheap, small-scale handbooks that lacked illustrations but were used to accompany dissections. He claimed that his models were more effective as they always offered images. The problem of communicating the shapes and connections of organs was considered crucial by many medical instructors, and illustrations in two dimensions, Ameline argued, could never fully convey these. Um, the advantages of his model pieces were especially obvious, uh, he said, in the description of muscles. On the dead body, they would lose shape as soon as they had been detached in the act of dissection, and they couldn't be put back into place. The solution, therefore, for Ameline was to model each muscle individually as it presented itself in situ in the living body, and then to make each muscle detachable and reattachable. Having prepared by uh, st studying muscles in this way, Ameline claimed his students were able to prepare muscles with the greatest ease in dissection. His choice of material also allowed for the introduction of didactic features, such as painting different nerves in different colors. Ameline presented um, these prototype models of detachable muscles to the Academy of Medicine in Paris in 1819, where academicians praised um, his models for their accuracy and for their utility, but um, they still required long hours of individual sculpting work, and they were not suitable for serial production and wide distribution. The design approach, which ultimately succeeded in turning anatomical models into products produced in series at a factory, uh, was developed by uh, a medical student, uh, Louis Ozu, whom you can see here. Uh, well, he's no longer a medical student in this photo, obviously, but... Um, uh, that's, that's the best I could do. So Ozu began his medical studies in Paris in 1816, um, and he began experimenting with the production of his own anatomical models as a student, just as Ameline had uh, done a couple of decades earlier. In 1822, um, he presented his first papier-mâché anatomical models to the Academy of Medicine. Uh, these models of a foot, uh, of a leg, thigh, and pelvis were still mounted on real human bone like Ameline's. Um, the Academy praised his work, but also put forward recommendations for further improvement. Um, the positive response from academicians also helped uh, Ozu get uh, financial support from the government. He received one and a half thousand francs. Um, that's roughly one and a half times the annual salary of a high-ranking civil servant, so quite a substantial sum, uh, from the Ministry of the Interior um, to produce a life-sized model. Now, Ameline's and Ozu's modeling efforts in papier-mâché were produced by the male anatomists themselves. They were intended for a male audience of medical students and teachers. Um, it's perhaps not surprising, then, that early accounts of these models and their makers did not explicitly gender the models or their use. In, in the modelers' descriptions and in, their, in the reports by their contemporaries, there was no um, indication of differently gendered understandings of models or materials. Acad academicians who commented on the early efforts of Ameline and Ozu took it for granted that their models would be used by male students. Um, they did not discuss the potential use by, by women. Um, several reports put forward the argument that artificial anatomy, such as Ameline's and Ozu's, could make the study of the body more palatable to those uh, who were otherwise disgusted by dissection. However, this remark still referred specifically to male students and med male medical practitioners who were not criticized for their disgust. Um, historical analysis of dissection have frequently highlighted its role in socializing medical students into their profession and as opportunities um, to demonstrate one's masculinity in the homosocial environment of the medical profession in the later 19th century. However, in the early decades of the century, reluctance to engage with the dead body was accepted in academicians' report as a common response, even among medical students and experienced practitioners, uh, which did not reflect badly on their masculinity. Both in model making and model use, um, these papier-mâché bodies were part of an array of objects, especially other paper technologies. Ozu, for instance, sub supplemented his study of the corpse itself with illustrations he collected from textbooks and scientific publications and with his own drawings. 
He also consulted authoritative scholars on specific subjects uh, such as the horse and the May beetle by correspondence. Um, these consultations then often came full circle. Once the new model was ready, Ozu proudly highlighted his collaborations with experts in his marketing materials. Production itself was a highly complex process which required a large number of techniques and materials. Central to the models was the use of a form of papier-mâché. Ozu developed his own secret recipe uh, for a mixture he called la terre, the earth. Um, this was a mix of paper, starch, hemp fibers, chalk, and ground cork, uh, which is quite crucial because it gave the model, uh, the material, some elasticity. And as, as his contemporaries were quick to point out, just as God had created Adam from uh, the dust of the ground, so Ozu's tear gave rise to his models. Hollow forms, such as the ones you can see here on the right, were made by pasting layers of paper strips um, into metal molds, and the resulting shapes were then sewn together. For solid parts, the forms were filled with la terre. Uh, larger models, such as the life-sized humans and the horse, also included an internal iron support. Um, other detail was added using different materials such as glass for the eyes, transparent membranes for wings, metal wires wrapped in coloured paper strips for veins and arteries. Uh, the finished parts were painted in layers of colour and a protective varnish and two different labelling systems were attached, one to identify anatomical details um, and the other a system of numbers um, accompanied by little symbolic hands which indicated the correct order of dissecting the models, as it were. So if you followed the numbers and you had a little synoptic table, you could take them apart and put them back together again, uh, and hopefully that way you, you then arrive at a, at a complete uh, model again. Um, I was once fortunate to dissect um, a giant Ozu snail, uh, took it apart, put it back together again, was left with three tiny little pieces, and I had no idea where they were supposed to go. So it's not, it's not as easy as, as uh, descriptions make it out uh, to be necessarily. Um, now, all these parts were assembled, uh, they were held together by little metal pins or hook and eye mechanisms, and then finally the model was, uh, was signed. Um, this is uh, an example of uh, the male model um, here, a life-sized uh, model containing 1,700 details. Uh, it was on sale for 3,000 francs, so that's still, that's still a very expensive object, uh, but it's, it's, it's only about a tenth of what an equivalent wax model would have cost. Um, academicians urged Ozu to also develop smaller, more affordable models, um, and he also presented a half-sized model at 1,000 francs and two very small models at 82 centimetres and 55 centimetres each uh, at 500 and 250 francs. Um, there were also other types of uh, models which you can see assembled here in the workshop um, around 1900. So you can see the horse on the left, for instance. You can see the gorilla on the right, uh, various types of developmental series. Oh, and of course, my, my favorite, the, the snail on the, uh, on the bottom as, as well, a couple of giant ears and eyes, um, etc. Um, he also created, for instance, a life-sized female model, um, Organs of Generation, a series illustrating uh, pregnancy, which I will come back to. Um, now, like um, the 18th century wax modelers I talked about um, at the beginning, Ozu also gave a nod to well-known works of art in his model design. Um, in his case, the life-sized male and female models echoed the poses of two uh, sculptures which were very popular in the 19th century, the Venus de Medicis and the so-called uh, Capitoline Antinous. However, uh, one might, and you can, you can see examples here, um, one might argue that his choice of sujet for the male figure, a portrait of the young lover of Emperor Hadrian, called into question the masculinity of his male figure. With his downward gaze and soft features, the young man appeared removed from the masculine ideals of action and strength embodied in the 18th century waxes. In addition, sometime in the 1840s, the male model lost its most eye-catching marker of gender. Uh, the penis, which had been prominent on early models, was left out of later copies, uh, presumably as Ozu began to target mainly lay audiences and schools as potential customers. 
Overall, Ozu's main concern seems to have been to adopt artistic references which will, would be well known to a wide audience. Um, in the 19th century, uh, both the Capitoline Antinous and the Venus de Medicis were frequently reproduced in smaller scales and in different materials to cater to customers from a range of financial backgrounds. So you would see um, miniature copies of both of these figures in materials ranging from plaster to marble, presumably to cater to all sorts of middle and upper class audiences. Um, and, and many people would be familiar from, uh, from them in, in, um, in living rooms uh, at, the, at the time. And similar, one could argue, similarly, one could argue that Ozu's female figure um, departed radically from earlier aesthetic conventions in quite crucial ways. While it paid lip service to female modesty and beauty by adopting the pose of the Medician Venus, um, it was devoid of markers of feminine beauty which had so fascinated the admirers of 18th century anatomical Venuses. So there's no real hair, there's no appearance of soft skin. Um, Ozu's females were upright, skinless, and bald, were just as upright, skinless, and bald as their male counterparts. And like them, they depicted all functional aspects of the body in equal measure, including muscles and the nervous system. Now, I've described the features uh, of models. Uh, model use, um, arguably, was shaped by a few uh, central physical features of the objects, uh, by the labeling system I mentioned, by the coloration, um, by the dissectability, uh, but also the array of other paper technologies which accompanied the model itself. A crucial element was the ways in which the models opened up. Ingenious cuts, very unlike those that would be performed in an actual dissection. However, this enabled full detachability as well as the visibility of the interior of organs. Accompanying paper technologies such as synoptic tables and the labels of the models themselves facilitated the identification of details and the order of dissection. And in addition, Ozu wrote a textbook um, in an accessible language using exemplars, uh, uh, using examples and comparisons familiar from domestic life. According to accounts by Ozu and his supporters, an understanding of the body's form and function was generated by working hands-on with the papier-mâché models uh, because they allowed repeated revision and an interaction with the model which combined the actions of the eye and the hand, such that, uh, in the words of one contemporary, one could fix the objects in one's memory, correct one's errors, compare objects among each other, and consider them together with matters of anatomical surgery and medical operations. This form of learning um, was considered to be autodidactic, potentially. Uh, the presence of a teacher was not necessary, as su supposedly authoritative knowledge was fully embodied in the model and its supporting materials. So if you just had a model and a synoptic table um, and spent enough time taking it apart and putting it back together again, the idea is you could learn all about human anatomy and physiology, just, um, just working with the models. Now... Um, an array of paper objects arguably also contributed crucially to the successful marketing of the new teaching tools. Um, it was facilitated by the introduction of new, uh, of new machines for faster paper production in the first third of the 19th century. National and international marketing efforts included, uh, for instance, the frequent catalogues which were distributed in French and English and later even in Japanese as a franchise was opened in Japan in the 1880s. Um, you also have um, pamphlets and even uh, printed form letters, um, basically, basically spam letters. You can see an example here in the middle, the, the, the large one. Uh, that's basically a form letter announcing the development of a new type of model. Um, and it basically, it basically said, dear fill-in name here, um, we've, we've developed this new, this new um, model and it's fantastically useful, this is, this is what it does and would you consider buying it for your university or school collection? And then they would be blanket mailed to universities um, across the country. Now, thanks to its new combination of materials, the finished product was considerably more sturdy than the traditional um, anatomical waxes and could be transported over long distances quite safely. Um, the papier-mâché bodies also largely escaped the corruption through heat and moisture, which made dissection in tropical climates difficult. 
This made the models particularly suitable for medical education in the colonies as observers, um, as commentators observed since the presentation of Ozu's earliest prototypes. Uh, so models were exported as far as India, Brazil, Australia, and the United States, um, and the model's robustness even enabled the introduction of a rental scheme. So if you couldn't afford to buy one of those models outright, you could just rent one for a month for a spot of at-home dissection. And there's a, there's a fabulous section in, in Flaubert's Bouvard and Pécuchet uh, in which the somewhat hapless protagonists do exactly that, only, only to raise an angry village mob because the villagers think that they're dissecting a real, a real body. It's highly, highly recommended and absolutely hilarious. Um, anyway, so, so uh, public lectures and, and paper-based um, output uh, were crucial for Ozu's marketing success, which enabled uh, the model's global circulation. In his marketing efforts, Ozu adopted a range of different personae, initially that of the inventor as a young genius, later as a humble craftsman who labored to perfect his products. But his, his most important public role, um, I would argue, was that of paterfamilias to his community of factory workers. In the 1830s, as he perfected his production process, um, Ozu founded a factory in his small hometown in Normandy. At the factory, men, women, and children uh, produced the paper paste, they molded the paper shapes, they labeled details, they wrapped paper strips around metal wire and attached um, the entire model. Um, Ozu also brought popular textbooks into the factory, which workers were meant to use to teach themselves gymnastics and choral singing. After moving away from his initial ambition to replace dissection in medical teaching with his human models, Ozu increasingly aligned himself with the new public health movement. Um, activists of the movement argued that healthy citizens were central to the achievement of social progress uh, and that public education was the key to health. Ozu endorsed these principles with his chosen motto, Know Thyself, the traditional credo of anatomists, which was frequently adopted by reform movements in the 19th century. Key to the reformer's approach was the assumption that the body was a kind of machine which could be manipulated and optimized by its owner. This mechanistic view of the body was evident in Ozu's textbook, for instance, with examples such as comparisons of the body to a steam engine. Physical engagement with the model was central to their power as teaching tools. Um, and thus, the first people to benefit from the object's educational potential were those who built them, the men, women, and children employed at Ozu's factory. Like many contemporary industrialists, Ozu provided paternalist care for his workers, from physical exercise and disciplinary measures to the institution of savings plans, um, and, and of course the choral singing as well, which was meant to generate a spirit of community. A core feature of his factory was the provision of anatomical instruction, so workers learned about anatomy and physiology from the models themselves. To publicize the high level of anatomical knowledge which his workers obtained in that way, Ozu occasionally staged public examinations of his employees as model students, model users who, thanks to the artificial anatomies, had acquired a substantial amount of anatomical knowledge. Uh, so one American physician who visited Paris um, in the 1860s, for instance, reported how uh, Dr. Ozu brought three of his work people, one man and two young women, uh, to Dr. Faw's anatomy class and examined them before an amphitheater crowded with students. The answers showed a minute and intelligent knowledge of anatomy superior to that of many medical students presenting themselves for the doctorate. Dr. Ozu, with just pride, pointed out the result as striking proof of the utility of his preparations. So students and doctors witnessed how these peasant anatomists answered questions about human anatomy, physiology, and generation. Uh, that such displays arguably uh, served two aims. They highlighted the fact that the models embodied sound anatomical knowledge, and at the same time, there was supposedly proof that with the help of Ozu's papier-mâché bodies, even unschooled men, women, and children from the Norman province could acquire detailed knowledge of the human body. Now, um, successful learning of anatomy and physiology with the aid of the papier-mâché models was showcased by Ozu in the case of his workers to publicize the model's power as teaching tools. Um, such educational success could also be used by students, both male and female, um, themselves for professional advancement and be instrumental in creating narratives of civilization and progress. 
One example of a successful student who came to some prominence in the European press uh, was uh, Pierre Boucher, a young man from Ozu's hometown, of whom I'm, I'm afraid I don't have an image. Um, I'll get to, to the chap in the fez in a, in a little bit. Um, Boucher had worked in the model factory since childhood and displayed talent for anatomy and physiology. He joined Ozu in Paris uh, to assist in the public lectures. And when he was in Paris, Boucher met this man, um, Dr. Antoine Clot, a French doctor who at the time was in service to the Viceroy of Egypt, Mehmet Ali Pasha. Mehmet Ali had ordered the introduction of hospitals and medical schools following the European model, um, and Claude was in charge of supervising uh, the establishment of these new institutions while arranging for exchanges between European scholars and promising Egyptian students. And on one of these visits, Claude convinced Boucher to join him as instructor of anatomy at the medical school in Abu Zabel near Cairo. Um, there, Boucher taught human anatomy uh, to around 400 students using both models and corpses, and he gave public demonstrations with models at a mosque in Cairo. Contemporary newspapers and other publications celebrated the achievement of this model student, student as proof of the success of Ozu's models and of his paternalist care. Dr. Clo reported in his publications that a central challenge for him in creating European-style medical education and medical care in Egypt had been the local population's resistance to using corpses for medical study. In Claude's account, um, paper tools such as Ozu's models served as intermediary steps on the way to European-style enlightenment. In addition to seeking toleration from local religious authorities, Claude reported the use of anatomical models and animal corpses to accustom students to working with human bodies. In his words, bit by bit, the students overcame all prejudice and repugnance and became convinced of the indispensable necessity of the study of anatomy. In their turn, then, the students served to change societal attitudes, to act, in his words, as so many apostles destined to spread the light of knowledge in the midst of a people still enslaved by prejudice and ignorance until the public became completely accustomed to the idea of dissection. Thus, models worked in the setting prepared by Claude. Remember that he was asking medical uh, religious authorities for toleration um, and in turn prepared the local community to make corpses work as well. However, um, Claude encountered resistance from the local community not only when it came to working with dead bodies. Families were reluctant to allow their daughters in particular to uh, enroll in the new school of midwifery. And eventually, um, Claude resorted to buying students. He bought girls from the slave market to train up as midwives. And from this group of trainees, um, soon a particularly gifted student emerged, as it had been the case uh, with Boucher in France. A young Abyssinian girl, Fatma, showed a thirst for knowledge and persevering industry, which, in the words of uh, contemporaries, enabled her to commence, poor slave as she was, a new era of civilization. A practitioner of great dignity and scholarship, she was eventually elevated to the post of director of the women's division of the hospital at Esbekir. As Ozu had staged exams of his factory workers to demonstrate the power of his teaching tools, so Claude as well arranged for public demonstrations of anatomy and examinations of his scholarly slaves to European visitors who concluded that Claude's efforts had rescued young half-savages such as Fatima and her fellow slaves from destitution and superstition and turned them into agents of civilization. Claude himself publicized the success of his trainees as evidence of Africans' intelligence. So while the models thus contributed to emancipatory claims that civilization could transcend boundaries of gender and race, the new medical institution's imposition of Western attitudes to the body simultaneously contributed to enforcing the gendering and control of bodies. As Mervat Hatem has pointed out, the graduates of the School of Midwifery uh, were instrumentalized to police female fertility, and in particular, they were, to claim, uh, they were to play a key role in the surveillance and criminalization of abortion, which was practiced at the time. Um, thus, in Egypt, the papier-mâché tools served to articulate both the boundary between male and female and between the civilized and uncivilized. Now, this um, reformist potential of the papier-mâché models 
was exploited not only in institutional settings such as the new state-sponsored medical schools in Egypt, but also by independent lecturers, especially in the United States. Um, in the US, Ozu's models were adopted early by popular medical lecturers, itinerant public speakers who advocated education on health and the body for general audiences as a way to uh, overthrow the medical monopoly of physicians and to make every man his own doctor. Um, not surprisingly, those claims didn't go down terribly well with local physicians um, who accused lecturers of quackery and licentiousness. And a prominent example of one such public lecturer who combined entertaining public events with a rhetoric of public emancipation from doctors' authority was Frederick Hollick, um, whose lectures focused strongly on matters of sexuality and reproduction, uh, and which he offered to both male and female audiences. Um, Hollick used Ozu models of male and female bodies to illustrate his outspoken lectures and was put on trial in Philadelphia for his explicit language and for the use of certain indecent and immoral figures and models in his lectures. He was quickly acquitted uh, but had to balance his emancipatory rhetoric with a modicum of respectability to maintain both his reputation as a fearless reformer and his appeal to his largely uh, middle class audiences. Um, women in particular campaigned for Hollick's exoneration and by association for their own respectability. Um, in Philadelphia, for instance, female demonstrators argued that it was a duty they owned the public and themselves to defend Hollick against anonymous charges of indecency made by interested jackanapes. Um, they used the uh, local press uh, to make their case and also defended Hollick's uh, um, pay papier mache models. Uh, one letter, for instance, confirmed that the mannequin or artificial anatomy by which Hollick illustrated his subject is a most wonderful machine. It is made of papier-mâché and represents the human body with admirable perfection in the shape, colouring and arrangement even to the minutest fibre. Now, other women not only publicly proclaimed their support for the itinerant medical lecturer, but actively adopted similar methods to further the cause of women's education and emancipation. They turned arguments about the necessity to overcome doctors' monopolies into arguments for female physical autonomy. One prominent example, which is the final example I'm going to use today, uh, was the American women's rights activist Paulina Wright Davis, who lectured on human anatomy and physiology using a life-sized Ozu model of the female body, which you can see here. Just as wax modeler Anna Morandi in the 18th century had used her identity as a mother to argue for her privileged understanding of the formation of flesh, so Davis used motherhood to legitimize women's access to anatomical and medical knowledge. She argued that basic medical education was crucial for the improvement of public health since, in her, her words, um, women with or without qualification do decide what shall be done and who shall do it when their families are ill. Women bore the responsibility for domestic care and for employing a competent family physician, and knowledge of the human frame was the only way to improve their choice. But education for women in medical and sexual matters was not just a practical measure to improve family health. Davis's ultimate goal was utopian, to restore humanity to its original perfection at the moment of creation. In her words, when he was made from dust off the ground, man was a model of physical perfection in his entire organization. While this perfection was lost today, in Davis's utopian vision, knowledge of the human body would enable post-lapsarian man to bring the body back to something like its primeval strength and beauty. This enhancement would go well beyond the body, affecting the mind and ultimately bringing about a better society. In her words, if the physical be improved, the mental and moral will be also. And when every faculty be brought to the highest state of perfection of which it is susceptible, the work will be most beautifully complete. Then the condition of the human family will be as completely felicitous as this life will admit. Models and diagrams in particular were highlighted by Davis as aids not to be despised in this study. Male and female supporters of her heroic enterprise pra pra praised her abilities as a lecturer, her delicacy, um, her graceful union of simplicity with intellectual superior superiority, as well as that wonderful machine, the Modèle du Femme. Uh, for Davis, perhaps, Ozu's models represented her imaginary prelapsarian humanity, strong and sturdy, physically perfect, and innocently naked. So to conclude, um, 
established analyses of anatomical models frequently highlight um, how such purportedly objective representations of male and female bodies articulate gender stereotypes. However, I would argue that it's crucial to understand such models not merely as representations, but as technologies. Um, when we pay attention to the materiality um, and the social context of models production, distribution, and use, uh, we can see how such practices have shaped and challenged gendered perceptions of model makers and model users. Motherhood, for instance, could be used to claim privileged understanding of the formation of flesh, as in the case of modeler Anna Morandi, uh, and also to justify female access to medical knowledge, for instance, for women's rights campaigner Paulina Wright Davis. Thus, while models could serve to reinforce traditional gender roles, as, for instance, in the case of the aesthetic conventions of the anatomical waxes, they could also be used to subvert or to change them. Uh, in some cases, empowerment and discipline went hand in hand. At the new Egyptian school of midwifery, for instance, papier-mâché models helped support African women's claims to civilization against established gendered and racial stereotypes, while at the same time, the new European-style medical regime imposed restrictions on local women's access to abortions. Modelers' move to papier-mâché mattered in many ways. The move allowed modelers to counter critics' objections to the fragile, expensive, and problematically luxurious anatomical waxes. Models' relationships to other paper technologies were especially important for articulating the new artificial anatomy's superiority and even utopian potential, and both Ameline and Ozu discussed their product's relationship to textbooks, to flap anatomies, and other paper tools, while Ozu in particular employed a wide range of paper uh, for his successful marketing campaign. Overall, the makers and promoters of papier-mâché models carefully balanced their comparisons. On the one hand, they highlighted similarities to well-established paper objects such as textbooks in order to appropriate for their own products the air of respectability, which was associated with more established forms of didactic material. Like textbooks, models could be, terriers, could be carriers of text in the form of labels um, and incorporate the most up-to-date knowledge of human and animal bodies. Like other paper tools, models could be taken apart and juxtaposed with other objects such as synoptic tables and other models. On the other hand, when it was opportune to highlight the innovative nature of the new models, makers stressed the differences between their products and existing teaching materials. Key features of the paper-based models um, were their three-dimensionality, their robustness, and detachability. Here, however, articulations of the model's utility had to be chosen with care, while producers themselves and users, such as Holick's female supporters, were keen to single out models' ability to be handled, taken apart, and reassembled, and asserted that these features accounted for the model's success as teaching tools. At the same time, they remained silent over the fact that this haptic appeal was potentially sensual and playful. Rather than dangerous dolls tainted with effeminacy and delicacy, the new paper bodies were celebrated as wonderful machines, devoid of moral or bodily corruption, ready to usher in a new age of public health and physical perfection. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.